good morning good afternoon good evening uh, wherever you're tuning in from um thanks first of all to the asia society india center uh, for putting together this really kind of exciting panel on the topic of mapping queerness gender and sexuality in south asian diasporic art um i'm really looking forward to an engaging hour of talks and discussion with our speakers today about their truly distinctive works uh, as thinkers um as artists as practitioners uh, of what professor gaitri gopinath calls a queer optic um a kind of expression of diasporic sensibility uh, that is attentive to the psychic the affective um and the temporal conditions of everyday life um so quick note on uh, just on the format as as radha mentioned our speakers will be sharing kind of short presentations of about 5 to 7 minutes um i'll briefly introduce each speaker before their talks and then we'll hope to engage in a kind of free flowing uh, dialogue for the second half of the event um again to our audience please feel free to ask your questions via the qna um function on zoom at any time during the event um we'll gather them and do our best to um to get to pose them to our to our panelists uh, so without um further delay i'd like to invite our first speaker gaitri gopinath um gaitri is a professor in the department of social and cultural analysis and the director of the center for the study of gender and sexuality at nyu she works at the intersection of transnational feminist and queer studies post colonial studies and diaspora um studies and is the author of two monographs uh, impossible desires queer diasporas and south asian public cultures and unruly visions the aesthetic practices of queer diaspora gaitri could i invite you to start us off please get you muted okay thanks thank you so much arna for the introduction and thank you to the asia society organizers as well for inviting us um it's really a delight to be in conversation with sunil and shazia and you know before i begin i just want to acknowledge a series of events that um the three of us did at university of cambridge just last week organized by vivek gupta and that's when uh the three of us were actually in conversation for the first time so i see this event today as really a continuation of those conversations and hopefully they can continue in the future so i thought i'd begin by highlighting a few passages and concepts from my most recent book on really visions the aesthetic practices of queer diaspora to show how the frame i set out in that book can productively situate both shazia and sunil's work in relation to one another because outside of the frame of south asian diasporic art their work doesn't necessarily seem to speak to one another so when i use the phrase um the aesthetic practices of queer diaspora I'm discussing visual art that articulates non-normative desires and embodiments in the context of diasporic movement, migration, dislocation, as well as dwelling. And so if we can go to the next slide please. So as I write here, the aesthetic practices of queer diaspora disrupt normative ways of seeing and knowing that have been so central to the production, containment and disciplining of sexual, racial and gendered bodies. They do so crucially through a particular deployment of queer desire and identification that renders apparent the promiscuous intimacies of our past histories as they continue to structure our everyday present and determine our futures so my point here is that these aesthetic practices allow us to both see to to see both space and time differently to make apparent the intimacy and conjoined nature as i say here of histories and geographies that seem to be discrete and separate given dominant forms of knowledge production and they do so crucially through queer desire and embodiment so queerness then is a kind of portal through which to see and sense differently so when i use the term queer here i use it in two different senses um first to reference non normative desires embodiments and practices that are typically obscured within normative history and second as a way of seeing right what i'm calling a queer optic and so if we can go to the next slide so as i write here these aesthetic practices enact an excavation of the past through a queer optic which allows us to apprehend bodies desires and affiliations rendered lost or unthinkable within normative history so queerness functions here as a method as an analytical frame as a way of seeing and sensing but queer and i think this is really important is always linked to the material reality of non normative bodies practices and desires and it's that sort of double valence of queer that i try and keep in play throughout the entire book so in so both of these senses of queer 
are at work, I think, in um, the overs of both Sunil and Shazia. Um, and I see their work in that sense as paradigmatic of what I'm calling the aesthetic practices of queer diaspora. So, you know, I think in both of their practices, um, we see a kind of instantiation of what I'm calling a queer optic that allows us to think of time and space very differently. Um, and in very different ways, they also make evident non-normative bodies, desires, and practices. So very quickly, I'll also say that the concepts concepts of curation and archive are closely related in the book. Um, so there are different levels of curation at work in the book. I see myself as a curator, as a critic, putting these, putting in conversation these artists that may not necessarily seem to go together. Um, and in so doing, in doing that work of curation as a critic, I'm also producing a kind of queer archive, right? And so the work of curation produces an archive. And I think that's very true um, in, in terms of the artists I write about as well. And I see um, the artists themselves as both curators and archivists. So Sunil, for instance, is quite literally, has quite literally been a curator throughout his career, as well as an archivist of his own work and that of others. Um, and, you know, I think an important part of his own art practice has been about making space for others through the practice of curation. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, and, you know, I also see Shazia as doing a kind of curatorial work by placing different art historical traditions and conversation um, by allowing us to see their deep imbrication. Both are also doing a kind of archival work. So, you know, Sunil is very much creating new archives, both personal and collective in his work. Um, and we see this, for instance, in the series Christopher Street, that is sort of giving us this um, rich sense of queer life worlds in the, a particular geographic location, whether it's New York City in Christopher Street or in Mr. Malhotra's party in Delhi in 2007. And then we also have a series um, of, of Sunil's, the next slide, please, um, entitled From Here to Eternity, um, where, if we can go to the next slide, please, where Sunil juxtaposes images of his own medicalized HIV positive body with that of shuttered sites of gay sex and sociality. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, please. And Shazia then um, is also doing a kind of archival work by excavating already existing archives um, and in so doing, creating new ones, right? So she's excavating an art historical archive that makes evident in, in a way that makes evident the queerness inherent in this archive. So we see this in her, a lot of her work. For instance, this painting, Intimacy from 2001, where you see these intertwined figures of an 11th century Indian Devata with Bronzino's 16th century Venus. Uh, and we see these um, figures um, replicated in her latest sculpture. And if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, entitled uh, Promiscuous Intimacies from 2020. And here, Shazia's work resituates the art historical archive, in fact, as a queer archive in the kind of desiring and conjoined and imbricated nature of these two figures. So I'll stop there, and hopefully we can pick up these threads in the larger conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gayatri, for kind of just a really evocative set of contexts and ideas for us to just open up uh, our discussion with. Um, next, uh, we have Shazia Sikandar. Uh, Shazia is a multimedia artist whose work shifts ideas of language, empire, and migration through feminist perspective, exploring gender roles and sexuality, cultural identity, racial narratives, and post-colonial histories. Um, Shazia is a pioneer of the form of the neo-miniature, which I hope we may uh, talk a little bit about, um, and has exhibited works at sites like the MoMA, the Whitney Museum, uh, and the Guggenheim. A traveling survey of her work opens March 20th at the Museum of Fine, Heart, Fine Arts in Houston. Uh, Shazia, please go right ahead. Hi, everybody. This is really a wonderful opportunity to be part of this conversation, so appreciate being invited. I am... Um, Going to share my screen. So my, uh, my work explores the interstitial, the in-between spaces 
those that which are hard to define, the transitory power, power and gender, power and powerlessness, power and women, the colonized, the migrant, the migrant and the citizen, the artist, all those and all that which is caught between worlds, between artistic vocabularies, between cultures, between practices, between histories. So being able to move in and out of um, glib categories of nationalities to observe from both outside and inside of the shifting divides, definitions, et cetera, they allow me to amplify dissonance and tension. So when I think of time and history, I'm always thinking of them as very alive and cyclical. And this point of view gives me a wide scope of imagining forms. Circularity also offsets as a concept, this pendulum, a kind of a movement between binaries like East, West, Asian, white, Islamic, Western, oppressive, free. So encountering um, such prevalent binaries themselves early on in the 90s led in my work to an outburst of uh, androgynous forms, fragmented bodies, headless torsos, and uh, these sort of characters that were half human, half half animal engaged with um, nature. They were the forms that refused to belong, to be fixed, to be stereotyped, to be defined. So sort of like exploring this in between territory, a recurring image often of a very buoyant, floating, often headless feminine figure whose feet would, would be roots, or it was sort of a ex symbolic exploration of creativity or, or the artist who carried its home within itself, for whom the notion of authentic, authenticity is not rooted to any linear understanding of nation or gender, but was um, always evolving and shifting, very much like nature itself. So um, these sort of series of drawings that I'm sharing um, explore this repertoire of forms and figures that sometimes are monstrous, um, sometimes playful, but they sort of evolved into a lexicon, a collection, so to say, of alter egos. And, um, you know, in, uh, in additional bound boundaries that were being blurred were also between form itself, between 2D and 3D, between the real and the imagined, man and woman, human and animal, nature and non-human and human, climate and human. So all sorts of categories that kind of as many distinctions that could be blurred and hierarchies removed to create a, a, create a language of forms that I could play with, whether they were being um, called out of uh, reading art history or the lack of um, uh, multivalent narratives within art histories, but this type of plurality that I was also ex exploring kind of ties to the very syncretic history of South Asia and my interest in, in kind of engaging with that inherent possibility that lies there. So, so this sort of developing an iconography which play, flirts with this idea of mythologies that get entangled with each other and they function uh, as well in this process of destabilization, destabilizing dominant and very narrow categories of um, uh, and definitions of gender and identity. So, um, so sort of sharing a, a wide range of, of um, works here to sort of show that, you know, um, how my work is very tied to drawing, but then the process of drawing is very much a thinking tool and it allows me to collaborate across disciplines and across different types of um, image making as well. And just a couple of examples like this work housed here is um, this cage-like form has a door and a pink heart lurks inside. And a similar form envelops a female silhouette in this in this particular work. And these iconographies at that time were tapping into my anxiety of being boxed into a stereotype on behalf of a culture or a religion. 
So this sort of responding to my inability to locate brown South Asian representations in the feminist spaces of the 1990s art world and actually much later as well and current uh, current definitions as well, um, uh, how art history functions, this sort of monolithic category of um, feminism, as well as third world feminism, which I was encountering, which was very limiting, and how this feminine is accumulated or discarded in history over time, how over lifetime in memories, but how this gendered form itself can take a stand against that erasure. So how to locate that sort of um, uh, uh, rupture of sorts. Another uh, example here that I will share is um, this work where, you know, there's this sort of red burst on the right work, which is sort of like a gesture of graffiti across my very meticulously labored manuscript painting work. So the stock characters, the lovers on horseback, they get obliterated, destabilizing the motif of heterosexual love, which is sort of a prevalent trope in the traditional manuscript paintings as well. So sort of uh, this nature of uprooting, like how do you engage with this process of, of um, uh, um, altering history or thinking of history as not as something to be glorified, but it's... Um, uh, but you're still engaged with the past to open up the a bridge to the future or to the present. So here I'm removing, um, I'm playing with the Radha Krishna trope, but have removed the masculine and just am interested in using the armature of the feminine as a apparatus of power. And in here, there are other, other mythological forms that are being introduced, uh, like the Chalava, which is sort of a poltergeist. And again, coming up with things which engage with something which, which inherently has this paradox that it defies um, rootedness. So this paradox of rootedness. And, um, it, it's a, and animation and, and movement and shifting the scale and space allows these um, iconographies to, to take root in, in, in multiple perspectives. So it's not just uh, an iteration through drawing, but through drawing, I can think of drawing as a libretto as well and can play with, um, with narration through composers and musics and poets. So sort of like bringing the whole armature of different languages that do have their uh, point of departure from a very South Asian sense of space as well. So I think I'm gonna end here. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Shazia, uh, for that really insightful um, presentation into your practice and into the crucial question, I think, of temporality as well when we're thinking of, of mapping in particular. Um, so we'll move on next to our final uh, panelist, uh, Sunil Gupta, who has been involved with independent photography as a critical practice for many years, focusing on uh, race, migration, and queer issues. Uh, a retrospective of Sunil's work was shown at the Photographer's Gallery in London in 2021, uh, 2020 to 2021, and has moved, um, has moved since to the Ryerson Image Center in Toronto. So Neil is a professorial fellow at UCA Farnham, and his latest book is titled London 1982. His work is held across collections at the Tokyo Museum of Photography, Philadelphia Museum of Art, Royal Ontario Museum, the Tate, the MoMA, amongst others. Uh, so Neil, over to you. Well, thanks very much, uh, everybody at Asia Society, for inviting me and the rest of the panel. And as Gayatri pointed out, it's fantastic to be able to continue our discussion uh, much earlier than we had predicted, in a way. Uh, so, be short of time, I think I'll just share the screen. I was basically wanting to make a particular point about communities of belonging and how... Uh, gay men, regardless of where they are, uh, gravitate uh, to such uh, cruising sites. Uh, so, so really I wanted to start here. Uh, I came, I grew up in Delhi, I was born in Delhi, and then when I was a teenager, suddenly found myself in Montreal and uh, discovered that my sexual activity, which I had no name in Delhi, had a name. It was called gay, and 
gay liberation was being born and I was very much became part of it. And so this is like the earliest public demonstrations of gay uh, people. It was part of a workers' rights May Day rally, actually, that I witnessed uh, and began to document. So this idea of recognizing other people like yourself has been key throughout uh, what I'm trying to do. Uh, so these are early years. So in Montreal, uh, I quickly found myself uh, uh, an extended family of friends and lovers, gay and and also others. Uh, on the left is uh, a rare fellow South Asian, also from uh, Delhi, and but originally from Lucknow. Salim Kedwai had come from Delhi University to study at McGill. Uh, and we formed a lifelong friendship there. It's uh, two rare so out South Asians at the time. And I feel these these networks then uh, that uh, us gay men are able to start with all kinds of people, then take us to all kinds of places. In the picture next door, is, uh, is just, I'm sitting there with somebody called Rudy, who I met in college. In, uh, we stayed together, we went to New York together, we came to London together, it transformed my life. So in New York, I was here in 76 for a year, uh, and I encountered this even more amazing public display of gay men uh, being very, very visible, cruising on the streets, being out and about, you know, uh, showing themselves to others and while also looking for others and it's a very comfortable space. It was nothing like I'd ever seen before. And uh, I spent my weekends photographing it. Now, of course, it was largely white. There were some black people there, but hardly any Asians at the time. I think these are the only two vaguely Asian people that I have in all of my negatives. So, and I think the one on the left is trying to not be noticed too much. And this was a more typical kind of scene. And it was very, uh, very, you know, uh, what's the word? It gave me a sense of a very broad community that I felt I could speak to any of these people who had shared uh, histories and a shared sense of a political moment of coming out in the 70s. So a few years later I found myself back in Delhi for the first time since I'd left. Now as an adult, now as a very out and proud gay man and I thought I'm going to find uh, people like myself. What if I'd never left? And so I began this sort of series of pictures uh, in a situation where nobody was really out and nobody really wanted to be uh, photographed, so it was a bit tricky. So uh, I began to take some. Uh, one on the left was more kind of in the documentary mold. That's what I was, uh, what I thought I was wanted to do. And on the right was more a kind of uh, dramatized mise en scène, which became my preferred methodology. I wasn't trying to out anybody. Meanwhile, by 1980s, Salim Kidwai had moved back to Delhi and stay, decided to stay there. I, meanwhile, found the whole atmosphere of no public context, no discussion around gay men, completely stifling for me, and I, I felt I had to remain based in the West. Uh, this is one of my early exploratory pictures that illustrated this article on The Guardian about how nobody would ever want to mention the word gay in Delhi in the 80s. And then I come back much later, uh, we're now in 21, and I'm looking at it, some archival images that I have of uh, uh, my childhood from the 1960s. This is the house I gr grew up in. This was a scene outside my house. We were in the last line of a Delhi colony. We faced the countryside. And I would go on this walk. It was a cruising walk. As a, as a young person uh, in my teens and earlier, I'd figured out how to find sex. This is where you went. It was behind a very famous monument called Humayun's Tomb. And this area that now looks derelict was occupied largely by men seeking sex. 
and in these uh, spaces within the uh, and around the periphery of the monument. And this is just a view of now I'm actually at the cruising site looking back towards my house. There's the little uh, monument on the left near the house and this is the larger one on the right. So these were shown only now uh, as by my gallery, Vadera Art Gallery at uh, Art Basel's OVR in Hong Kong last year. And we're going to show these along with the other cruising pictures in Delhi in September because I want to build this larger case about uh, why gay stroke queer men still persist in going cruising outdoors. Exiles was a sort of, in the mid 80s, I went back to look at uh, cruising in Delhi in these very specific ways and gathered some text as well. These were all, of course, directed mise-en-scene type photos. Uh, and you know, so this is what people were telling me then. So even if you have a lover, you should get married and have children who would look after you in your old age and so on. Then in the 2000s, I lived in Delhi to become, uh, in a sense, part of the community there at the height of the whole business about changing the law and became a kind of activist again, relived my youth, joined Nigar, uh, got involved with people. We started the Pride in Delhi. Here we are demonstrating on the street. But by then, queer had arrived in a way. So I felt like Delhi had missed L had lesbian and gay. They went kind of suddenly everybody was queer in the 2000s. And to the extent that my gallery published a monograph of mine and we called it Queer, that, that was 2011 and that seemed fine. This is after decades of never wanting to mention lesbian or gay. And then of course the whole Indian situation of change the law, change it back again, and then this repercussions of course became global. So this is us all over the world now fighting back for, for the judgment in Delhi. And then I went back uh, with my partner to make this book and where we explicitly want to state that you cannot become queer or gay or lesbian until you meet other similar people because you, you don't grow up being explained about it or being introduced to them. And it's a case of finding your community uh, and that whole process and it works across the classes. So our book was a kind of collection of 17 life stories for across the social spectrum of Delhi. And finally, I went, the Christopher Street pictures were brought back to life for a fashion uh, purposes by Helmut Lang. They asked me to come and take pictures of Christopher Street today, how it might be. And of course, that has also changed. It's not just gay men anymore. Uh, what was gay is now more queer, and it features a much wider range of genders and all the rest of it. So I think I want to conclude there. Uh, and say that this has been an important segment of what I've been about is to try and find out who and what I am, which was a gay Indian man, of course, but for the first half of my life, nobody wanted to mention it, regardless of where I was. So it seemed a rather solitary activity with my one informant friend uh, partner in Lucknow, Salim Kidwai, uh, who unfortunately has now passed away. So uh, I'm still at it. So I'll leave you with that. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Sunil, for that really kind of insightful trajectory into, into your own um, both subjectivity uh, as a queer person, but also kind of how it's interacted with your work um, across time. So um, I think what we, uh, you know, while we gather the questions um, that are coming in, people are still uh, kind, of, kind of gathering their thoughts. I, I just wanted to, to open up with an opportunity for discussion across all of our panelists. And that's specifically around one of the operative terms that's in the title for today, which is that of diaspora. Um, right now, diaspora is like traditionally been framed in terms of a kind of genealogy or a generationality, right? A lineage that is often considered familial or patrilineal, whether that's, um, and often that's in reference to a kind of uh, home nation, right, as a, as a reference. Um, now, Gaiti, maybe you could perhaps come in here to talk a little bit about how your conception of diaspora, I think, unsettles this idea of lineage in really interesting ways and kind of looks for forms of kinship that is 
outside of that you know straight generational line so to speak um and i think maybe that's also a place that uh, shazi and sunil if you'd like to jump in about kind of how your own work navigates these claims to a kind of um generationality or a lineage whether shazia that's in your work in terms of uh, an art historical background or uh, sunil whether it's in your search for a kind of place of originary belonging that might not exist um perhaps maybe uh gayatri if you'd like to start thank you arnav i mean i think you sketched it out really well um you know the concept of diaspora has been actually quite limiting in certain ways because it does presume a kind of originary authentic site from which you disperse and so i think in all my work what i try to do is push against that kind of framing of diaspora and instead um suture queer to diaspora in order to dislodge precisely the kind of patrilineal um uh sort of uh genealogy of the term so you know if we think of the work of somebody like shazia for instance you know what or or sunil for that matter you know what i see what i'm calling the aesthetic practices of queer diaspora do is radically disrupt that kind of one way flow that we um associate with diaspora and and the kind of inherent um genealogical implications of the term so you know i like to think of diaspora not as origin departure but instead as a kind of web of affiliation and affect right and i think that's that comes out quite clearly in both shazia and smith's book uh perhaps Shazia and Sunil so, if you like yes and you go ahead yeah i just wanted to just so to carry on from what guy three saying for me the journey because i'm first generation i uh, i made the the journey from a to b and i think i made a more relatively recent discovery that my focus had been on departure that there was this homeland that you left behind you know when looking back at this thing but what i've come to realize that was really important and if you probably gathered from my little story that i just explained that the important point for me was not the departure but it was the arrival it was only after i arrived in montreal did i figure out what i was really interested in and what i was even doing in india but the indians didn't give me any language for it i only found that in montreal and that was a kind of revelation to me so uh so diaspora never makes any sense to me because it sounds like it's one thing or the other and it's not it's a kind of the interrelationship and the informing from different experiences and so on it's a kind of i hate to use this word it sounds really phony but it's a kind of internationalism it's a kind that i think a lot of dominant ideologues don't want to accept they like their own version their version is colonial ours is not colonial ours is one of being informed and being realizing the complexity of our life which span uh, continents and generations and stuff like that so for me uh, that's what's important i have no issue with also being indian you know i do feel if i feel like uh, i feel like i belong more not more but in a sense to all of these places like i'm in london i'm in north america or i'm in india i get off that plane and i smell the air and i'm home it doesn't matter whether it's toronto or new delhi or london you know uh and i feel privileged that i can do that and i realize that all of us in a way are able to kind of do this uh i do however feel like in india in particular that there's a kind of enormous polity and work being done to build an ancient culture into a new nation that i feel yeah maybe a little bit more pull towards compared to london which i see as a kind of old country the old colonial power in its sort of fading glory rather you know so that way the context does make a difference so i do feel like my subject sometimes lies in india often yeah shazia no of course i i um, you know i hear what you're saying in yourself i feel so outlined is this sort of philosophy that i think you know exists in terms of movement in terms of functioning as artists in terms of you know image makers as well so um just to say you know growing up in pakistan for example 
not having easy access even to now getting a visa to visit india has always been a very difficult route so it's sort of never really having the freedom to physically go across the border and experience all the sort of um sites and archives and um things that i was wanting to study with my interest in art history so sort of like how do you compensate that intimacy that we are supposed to represent in being south asians when we are in di- in a diasporic terrain and yet the political nature is such that you do not have access to that intimate space so i kind of want to question that you know to all of you that how do you how do you come to terms with that and i think that has also been a, a an intellectual um engagement of mine and eventually over time and then having you know kind of being in the west and being able to l- look at the archives and sort of the more i engage with the archives the more i understood that how much of that has not necessarily been uh cataloged and in that ma- in that aspect they are it's sort of invisible it, it there's there's never enough money within a western institution to uh focus on the archives that are non western and yet it holds a, a large amount of of undocumented or unarchived material as well so that kind of the the you know the uh the layers the nuances of of uh of all the meanings embedded there as well as the provenance of objects and uh, these things have always interested me so this in this way i think my work was naturally dealing with this kind of decolonizing right all of us are in that process so that too now seems you know um, of the moment or is much more in vogue in conversation but these are things that i think it one was already involved with and even in terms of like um again so i so what i appreciate tremendously is is when guy 3 articulates um my work in conversation with some of these uh um themes it it's a very a uh, generative space and you know in in 20 years ago such uh, uh such articulation was i did not have access to it and i'm unfortunate for that because then binary you know definitions that rely tremendously on binaries so what does that mean what does east west mean anyway what does you know when where, what does a south asian diaspora also uh, mean because in there so much um um differences and so many different types of languages and variety and range and all of that so all of that you get homogenized uh for whose priority or for whose function and so sort of that space i think um is full of um fodder and potential material as an art, as an artist to to play with okay uh, perhaps get get i could uh, sorry uh, sunil would maybe you'd like to go ahead first okay, um i i think you're muted sunil Well, Shazia brought up this issue of the diversity of the South Asians and their diaspora locations. And of course, it's very true because I've had this total experience of the British-born, second-generation South Asian uh, diaspora here in this country, the UK, as opposed to South Asians from India and Pakistan. This is, I'm talking about our art world. So when there's an exhibition, there's a huge distinction between uh, whether you're living in Lahore or Delhi or living in some London suburb and shows get organized that way and I honestly I made two shows in the eight, in the beginning of the 90s the economy of science about photographers who live in India and another one called fable territory is about photographers who live in the UK and you can imagine what the response was and I tried to export them both back to the subcontinent and i can't tell you how there was how little interest there was in what the diaspora was doing which i thought was very sad and on the other hand when i was a student uh, as a like a diaspora student in a fancy art school here rca for example there would always be a student from baroda or some indian place 
who was there, but very much as a visiting tourist Indian, you know, who was working on Indian art and so on, who was not interested in our issues as brown diaspora. There was a clear divide, and, and I think it was financial, cultural, and in many ways. And I think sometimes we, we, we overlook that in our uh, desire to confront the much more powerful colonial, white colonial power that we confront. But there, there's been quite a lot of that goes on. So I'll leave you with that thought. That's really helpful, Sunil, and I think it speaks to a question that an audience member, um, Angela, had, which was to kind of ask about how the message or history of queer art of South Asia differs from, let's say, other parts of the world, um, which is kind of, I think, a question around internationalism that you that you stated very helpfully. And so maybe, guys, we like I could invite you here to speak a little bit about navigating internationalism when thinking about diaspora. Uh, outside of kind of regional histories, and you know, I, I know in your in your most recent book, for example, you move from a South Asian archive distinctly to working with kind of the Lebanese photographer Akram Zatari. So maybe you know, in conversation with Sunil and Shazia's um, internationalism themselves, how do you kind of navigate that that question of of um, looking at diaspora more globally outside of let's say a South yeah. Asian um, identity position? Yeah, thank you for framing it in that way. I, yeah, so, you know, my work has sort of become more and more interested in going outside just the South Asian diaspora and thinking about sort of intersecting, overlapping diasporas, you know, and how we can think about queerness in these different sites and put them in conversation. And so, you know, what what strikes me, you know, looking at Sunil's work, for instance, you know, the, the cruising images are the ways in which, you know, there's a, a real specificity um, to those images in terms of where they're located, right? Um, um, and, you know, what, what those images say to me is the way in which, you know, these, these queer desires have always been sort of intrinsic to these spaces that we think of as inhospitable to their flourishing. And, you know, as Sunil is saying, they were in terms of identity positions, but certainly not in terms of practices, right? And perhaps not even in terms of a certain kind of sociality that could be could be built through these kind of cruising practices, right? And so for me, you know, what I try and hold on to in my work is the, the historical specificity of, of the, the site while thinking about the resonances between these different geographic locations. In the context of South Asia, it's impossible to sort of separate out you know, what queerness means there outside of a, a very specific nationalist history, colonial history, you know, um, in relation to what's happening now, you know, and in relation to this kind of fascist Hindutva um, moment that we're in, I think queerness has another very particular valence. I just wanted to say, you know, I was so struck by that image that Sunil showed from Montreal in the 1970s, you know, this is sort of a documentary image, but it really speaks to the way in which, you know, gay rights and workers' rights, for instance, were really deeply intertwined. And I think, you know, that's the importance of the kind of documentary practice that Sunil uh, gives us. You know, he's excavating a certain archive for us where queerness was seen as absolutely intrinsic to these other struggles, right? And I think it's very important to bring that moment into the present to think about what queerness now, the work we wanted to do. Thank you. Sunil, did you have your hand up? Okay, maybe. Um, thank you so much. Uh, we have, um, you know, a similar question around the archive by uh, one an anonymous um, audience member who who asked that you know all the panelists have spoken about creating and now having access to archives that speak of identity, queerness, and diaspora. Through your works, do you consciously think and hope um, of kind of contributing to a, a future archive? Let's say of um, uh, you know of the kinds of archives that now you are gaining access to. I, I wonder if Sunil, um, you know, you'd like to yeah. respond to that. Totally, I was uh, I was horrified. I had my art training in the West, uh, five full time years, and uh, no mention of India, no mention of anything queer or gay. Uh, and uh, I resolved to I couldn't find myself there. Uh, 
And so I, it was my resolution to make very specifically work about being gay men in India, from India, whatever, related to the subcontinent, and to put it into art history because it just wasn't there. And so, uh, so I'm happy to report that, yes, that eventually happened in the sense that that exile's work about Delhi is acquired by MoMA, so it's it's entered the, you know, the art historical discourse. So in a sense, that was a very practical goal that I had developed for myself. Now, of course, one moves on from there. I think, Shadia, that, that is kind of my give you an opportunity to respond as well in terms of re responding to an art historical archive. Um, an audience member named Brian Curtin, um, you know, asks whether Shazia has a comment on the decorative as a queer mode in your in your work. And I know you've spoken sometimes with some resistance to like the categorization of your work as being intricate or, or decorative or, or kind of in, in some ways. I wonder if you want to just talk about um, what is going on when we talk about the decorative in your work and whether it's a kind of queer expression as well. Well, um, I, I, I just wanted to add to the earlier conversation in terms of um, archives and in terms of introducing, you know, an alternative um, image or vocabulary or, 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 or language. And I think in that respect, um, bringing um, manuscript contemporary or what, what is now called the new miniature, that sort of genre into a very, uh, within, into an international art practices. I think in that respect that the sort of like the last 30 years of highlighting and, and bringing that as a contender and opening that space has also been um, very much in kind of opening space in this, um, in, in, in ideas of, you know, visual representation. So within within the knowledge and understanding of like how to define um, the manuscript genre, usually the, the, the definitions would focus, you know, too much on this um, uh, decorative nature or kind of an opaque reading of sorts. And there's a whole sort of history of, of, uh, of art history from a very white male perspective on in terms of how art history is defined. So in, in you know, and, and then taking those definitions and opening them up and then exploring them or engaging with with the with the problematics of that, I think has been really uh, material in the work. So when I when you're talking about decorative, I'm not thinking literal in terms of the kind of the detail in the work. Like I don't have any issues with engaging with detail. Like I think detail is a is a is a is that a kind of a, a mercurial space that allows me to uh, play with issues of time, labor, temporality, as well as uh, a wit and candor in there. So I'm not interested in decorative in the sense that it's um, it's about um, a something which is uh, without like intellectual weight or meaning. And for me, actually, when I think, actually, it's reminding me of another thing that Gayatri had pointed out, which was the, the body in excess of gender. And I think that is far closer to my engagement with the, with the decorative, is that the body just becomes, you know, beyond its own sort of desire and representation, and, and it keeps doubling and spinning out of control. And in that sort of space, it is able to provide alternative reads about it so it's not just the feminine form or it's not just the masculine form it takes on a multiplicity and i think that's where how i see the idea of of targeting and expanding on this sort of very limiting narrow idea of the decorative guys you do you want to respond about the the body specifically as a kind of archive yeah, I mean, I just want to say, you know, that's that's one of the things that I've been trying to really flesh out in my reading of Shazia's work is precisely the way in which, um, as Shazia said, the body actually sort of explodes gender itself in her work, you know, and so I don't think we can think of normative categories at all in relation to 
um, the way in which Shazia uses the figure, you know? And so you have these feminine figures that are completely um, human, not human, more than human. You know, they, they loop, they, they, they spin, they, um, they fragment, right? They're, they're distorted. And so, you know, I think that to me is a very queer mode, right? The, the, the ways in which the, the, the figure itself is exploding these categories of gender itself. Um, and so, you know, to me, that's one place where I locate queerness in Shazia's work. And then the other place I locate queerness is precisely in how she gives us this other way of seeing that brings together these, these histories that are, that, uh, that we, um, that we have been enjoined to keep separate, you know, because of these kind of, you know, these, these sort of, you know, very disciplining and surveying modes of understanding nations, right? And so I see her as doing a really important work as pushing against these kind of nationalist ideologies. And, you know, I just have to say that in this particular moment, um, I see that work as, as absolutely crucial, you know. Um, I mean, it's doing a really important kind of political work. Yeah. Definitely. And I think also it articulates a kind of uh, something that Shazia, you spoke about in your presentation about invisibility and visibility um, as well in terms of kind of the way that certain bodies are not legible or they're hidden or partially um, made public. And in that, in that, I just maybe like to ask Sunil to... Um, in these closing moments, if you'd like to comment on on the role of the kind of body in your work, um, especially in you know in 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 some of your in your exiles work where you kind of identify these queer spaces in which the gesture and comportment feels so important, I was just wondering if you'd like to speak a little bit about uh, how you place the body in your uh, in your photos. Oh well, it was definitely a moment of trying to place the. Uh, the brown gay male body, uh, give it an image, it seemed to not occur anywhere, not in art history, not in the cinema screen, not even in gay culture. So we had all these free gay magazines that circulate the gay scenes in London and New York, and white models galore, black models sure, East Asians even, but South Asians never. I've never seen, I began to feel like, you know, nobody wants you. You go on Grindr and it says no fats, no femmes, no Asians, basically. You know, so I, I didn't see any pictures. I was, you know, that was, uh, we need body images of ourselves, I feel. Uh, you know, sometimes I forget that when I walk into a room that, I don't look like everybody else, you know, that that's a kind of experience that we can have. And it can happen in in other subcultures too, you know, I have uh, uh, wonderful uh, African-American friends in the States and if I go, might go to a social event with them, everybody's black, and like, where are the Indians, you know, nowhere to be seen. So, uh, yeah, just... Uh, I feel there's a real shortage of uh, brown bodies uh, and cultural representation, and I feel the need to make more. And of course, of course, with Indian, uh, with South Asian bodies, there's always this issue of well, like how much can you show? And I've run, I've had trouble with that by, uh, you know, so uh, how much is okay? Especially when I'm living in a culture in the West, in London, where. Uh, it's never enough. You can show you can show everything. It's still not enough compared to. So you make work for here, or do you make it for there? Or you're just trying to find that balance of how do you move the work around? Uh, yeah, my work about living in a bathhouse. I came a cropper in Delhi, so that's <laughs> also, yeah. And I'm sitting on archives, photo archives from Delhi, that I cannot show to anybody because half the city would get outed. You know, so what, what can we do there? <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, uh, Sunil. I know um, we've kind of come to the end of our time today. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, our panelists, uh, Shazia, Sunil, and Gayatri for just a really rich um, discussion in an impossibly short time frame. Um, and I hope we'll be able to uh, have this conversation again 
uh, at Asia Society or other similar venues. Thank you to all the organizers um, and our panelists for making this possible. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Adnan. Thank you. It's a pleasure to talk to Thank you, you both. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. Thanks.